Hello and welcome to Really Cool People, a podcast produced by Schweitzer Church. I'm your host, Jason Leininger. This is a place to hear stories of really cool people. And the hope is, is that you and I, as we listen, as we engage, that we will be inspired, encouraged, and challenged through moments of serendipity. In a sermon entitled The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis said, There are no ordinary people. You and I have never talked to a mere mortal. So it's my joy over the next few moments to introduce you to somebody who may to themselves or to the other folks around them may seem ordinary, but they are a really cool person. Today, we're going to meet Laura Kenny. She's going to talk about being the oldest daughter of a dentist in St. Charles. She's going to talk about coming to to SMS or what is now known as Missouri State University, building a life and a family with her husband, Gordon, and really a an undercurrent that runs throughout her story is the deep desire and the hunger, the thirst that she has for God in her life. And so she's going to talk about that in a number of different ways. Today, wherever you're at, hope you enjoy this conversation. Here's Laura. Well, today we're happy to welcome Laura Kinney. Let's uh, let's start with your story. Okay. Um, my story, I was born in the 50s, shows how old I am, and I was the first of four children. I'm the only girl, and I have three younger brothers, um, and really my childhood was like what you see on TV. It was it was a kind of a real carefree time, I think, to be alive and born, 50s and 60s, because you we lived in a neighborhood. We could just run up and down all day and play. We could get on our bikes and go anywhere, and um, my mom was a stay-home husband stay-home mom. My dad was a dentist in town, one of the first dentists in St. Charles. And um, so it was all, that was all good. I um, attended the Methodist church there. It was called the First Methodist Church and still is. And my dad, that's one of the first things he wanted to do, I guess, when he moved to that area, because he's actually from the Flat River area, is find a church and find a church home. So that he did. And so I was raised Methodist and went there. I've always been Methodist. Um, and that was a big part of my life because a lot of my friends, um, even from the neighborhood, we all went to church together. And, um, one of the biggest things I remember about the Methodist church experience was we had a, um, experience, which is like a weekend experience called a lay witness mission. And that came in to our, our church when I was around 12 or 13. And they have all kinds of activities for the adults and then activities for the youth, activities for the kids. And they're really just lay leaders that come in and just share Jesus. And so that's really when I accepted Christ. They had a big altar call at the end of the weekend. And um, that was a really, that was, of course, a huge turning point for me um, at that age. And all of us accepted Christ at the same time, all the youth group. And um, so really, we were on fire for the Lord through junior high, high school. Um, our church started a, a band called New Faith, and we it was a musical band, and we almost all of us were in, in this group. It was a big group, and we traveled to different Methodist churches. And, um, and then, like I said, we just, I got into Bible studies that way, just a big community, started, you know, praying for each other, um, just really it was a lot of my molding, I think, through junior high and high school. Not that I didn't have my other moments, but really that, that kind of kept me on fire. When I was um, ready to select a college, I decided on SMS, MSU now. Uh, about half my girlfriends, I had a big group of girlfriends, went to MU, and my, my brothers also did too. Um, but I chose SMS, and you think that's, that really is a big pivot for people because that's really that's where I met my husband, Gordon. Um, a lot of my friend groups now are because of that. Um, attended, you know, Wesley and then Schweitzer. So I think that's always a big thing. I think is where you choose to stay, stay, or where you go to college. Um, at least for me, it was. So I graduated from there in the '70s um, with a secondary education degree, um, with an emphasis in psychology. So I wasn't really sure what to do with my psychology degree. So. I was able to teach it for a couple of years, um, taught in a real small community called Everton, um, right out of college, and um, just taught there for two years, and really got to do almost more counseling than I did anything, because this was a very small, impoverished area, and it was a small school, and um, I was the only social studies teacher, K, uh, junior, all junior high and high school, so that was a really interesting time. So I taught for two years, got burned out, 
And um, in the meantime, had met Gordon. We got married in 1981. And after I taught school for a couple of years, I was looking for another teaching job that was closer to home because Everton was about 30 minutes away. And um, I, a friend told me about a travel agent job. And so I applied for that, which was totally off my radar, and uh, did that for about three years. And that was a really fun job, you know. Um, got to travel some. Um, spent a, I mean, a lot of the time, you just been in the office booking travel for people. But it was just a really great experience for me. Um, and then after that, I kind of started, Gordon, my husband has a company called MedPay. So I was one of his first claims administrators there while I was actually pregnant with Marshall, my first son. So then I had two boys. I had Marshall in 1984 and uh, Mason in 1987. Very proud of my boys. Um, they've done really well and they're married now and I have two grandchildren. So... Um, but then my time when the boys were growing up, I did choose, and I was blessed. I'd have to say I was blessed to be able to stay home with the kids. So I did stay home all those years, and um, but had to find things to do, of course. So I was involved in a lot of volunteer work and on the school level and helped out anywhere I could with anything. And also kind of got involved. Um, I was really craving in my faith a... Um, a some, something. I, I knew I needed something. And so I was playing tennis with a woman, a friend of mine now, and she invited me to Bible Study Fellowship. And it was the very first year of Bible Study Fellowship. And that's when I got involved in it. And uh, that's, which is still going. It's been going now for years. But I, that was a big thing for me because both the kids went through the children's program. I was in it for over 20 years. I was a, a leader there for seven or eight years. And um, it was probably the first real community of women that I'd ever experienced because um, you get into a small group type of environment. And uh, so that, that was a big, a big thing for me. Um, after that, I got involved in a ministry called uh, The Caring People, which was started years ago. And now it has merged with another single mom's ministry. But I was a Springfield area chair for that. And that meant we started small uh, care groups throughout the city of Springfield for um, single moms and their children. And um, that was a big part of my life, too. Um, when I retired from that a few years ago, I really wanted to get more involved here at Schweitzer because I did feel like caring people kind of was taking me outside a little bit of actually getting involved here. So I just started praying, and God always answers our prayers. And I said, the first thing you, you bring, I'll say yes. And I did. And I said yes to one of the first things, and I can't even tell you now what it was. But that yes led to the next yes, to the next yes. And um, what a blessing because I just feel like God has just surrounded me with some awesome women, some awesome um, other couples that we, we've gotten to know better and um, really brought us into community here at Schweitzer. Um, so we, we love it here. And the next thing I guess I was just thinking of was that um, my husband had a heart attack in June of 2022, which was a really big thing for our family. Um, it was a real life and death situation. And... Um, we were in the hospital for six weeks, started here in, in Branson. It happened at the lake. And then we were um, air vacked, or he was air vacked to uh, KU. And um, that was a, a big thing for us, like I said, because everything had been going along great, you know? <laughs> and then boom. And that's kind of how life is, you know? And we learn from those experiences that, um, you know, we're not in control, that God is, because it's, whenever we have those things, we're, we feel totally helpless at times. We didn't know exactly how it was all going to turn out, and God just kept showing me that He was with me. I could actually feel like at times He could actually see me, look at me, um, because sometimes you don't think anybody else really understands where you're at. Um, and I had my boys, and I had my and daughter, great daughter-in-laws, and um, everybody was very supportive and family. But it was it was a real it was it was a, it was a big thing for us. Um, but I did realize through it that no matter what comes our way, what tragedies or anything that comes our way, that um, God never changes and that He, we have to concentrate on who He is and really hang on to those things. And I knew that He was good. I knew that He was love. I knew that He was with me. And those are the things I had to really concentrate on when I wasn't sure how things were going to go. Um, they always say that Sometimes more good comes out of those experiences than anything. I really, I really do believe that when you look back on it. And it was a big faith grower for both Gordon and I, too, as a couple. 
recently, my dad died six months ago in October. That's always another transition, I think, for us because my mom and dad were both living in their home. And I just felt really lucky because I'm one of the only ones that still had my parents at my age. And um, so that's kind of just changed a lot of things for for us. My, they live in St. Charles area. And um, so now my mom, you know, is she just she just transferred or transitioned herself to a living center, a senior living center. So that's been a big thing for her. We sold our house and her house. And um, so we've that's been kind of the last few months I've been dealing with. I think that's kind of where I am. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Today, I guess. Thanks for taking us on that journey. Yeah. You, you covered a lot of ground um, and spoke to many things. Some things um, that you described, I, I wonder if you could, if we could spend a couple minutes and you could unpack those just a little bit more along the way. Sure. Like one of the things you talked about was a lay witness mission. Mm-hmm. And some folks will know what that means. And some folks will be like, tell me more about that. Because what? What's the experience of a lay witness mission? I've never seen one in my, my you life. you never seen one in your life? Huh. Yeah. Um, I think it actually grew from the Methodist um, mm-hmm. denomination. I don't even think they exist anymore, I don't believe. But at the time, that would have been in the well, so 60s, I guess, it was kind of a thing. And they were going to different Methodist churches. Mm-hmm. And it was basically, it was a weekend of lay leaders that were on a team, and they had a coordinator. Yeah. And... Um, they came into a church, and they would stay in people's homes. And just all through the whole weekend, there would just be all these different just, you know, life-building type and community-building type activities, you know, potluck dinners. There'd be um, all kinds of different classes during the day that they would offer. And, and basically, the lay leaders were just sharing who Jesus was to them, you know, huh. and how they um, who, who God was to them, who Jesus was to them. And it was just about building relationships kind of through the whole weekend. And there were young people on the team. Like after we had our lay, win- lay witness mission at our church, I became part of a team. And I went to oh, two or three different small churches around the state of Missouri. And um, so you had a, a youth, youth people that went, then you had the, the others too. Um, and then, like I said, the culmination was on Sunday. They had a, a huge altar call, which yeah. is not really we think of in <laughs> back in the '60s Methodist. Um, and I mean, literally at our church, they, that we were ten ten feet deep. Wow! I mean, people were piled up there accepting Jesus. And then the the lay leaders are the ones that kind of then you know pray with you up there, as well as your own pastoral staff. Uh-huh. You know, so um, yeah, it was kind of a. A, a thing back then, a concept, yeah. As you were describing that, I almost uh, had the image or the some of the pictures from the Jesus Revelation, uh, Jesus Revolution film mm-hmm, that came out mm-hmm. a year ago, and that described what that kind of robust spiritual engagement was like in the late '60s, early '70s in California. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I mean, I've heard these a few stories here and there about lay witness mission, but yeah. that was kind of the image that came to mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was kind of an awakening. Uh-huh. I think they were wanting to awaken the church yeah, yeah. and just raise up leaders. And um, yeah, it, it was. And I don't, I don't like. I, said, I don't even know when when they stopped that. You know, because they would come into that church for the weekend and just kind of take it, take over the church. <laughs> yeah, that's what you did. Yeah, a f- few years ago, when I was on a district committee, I had heard about people who had been commissioned as lay witness speakers, and they had been on a few of these teams. Hmm. So that was. Like still, the embers were somewhere within the mm-hmm. within the confines of Methodism, but the the ember it was pretty much just embers at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The other thing you said about that was that your church put a a band together, like a young. We we yeah, we, we did. Yeah, you had yeah. a group of young people that was saying. Uh-huh. Yeah, we had some really good musicians that were like even a year or two older than than me. And they kind of got that started, and we would practice every week. And um, then we would, I mean, we sang just kind of basic songs, but we w- with tons of enthusiasm and uh, clapping and all that. And we would entertain. We you know, actually came to our own church and did yeah. little concerts, uh-huh. you know, as yeah. well as, like I said, yeah. we were invited to come to other churches too. Yeah. Do you remember any of the songs? Um, I Am the Resurrection and the Life, If You Believe in Me. You clap your hands. Oh, oh and uh, pass it on. Do you remember oh, the song "Pass, pass it, it On"? That was yeah. one of our big songs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to go to other ones. It only takes a spark. It only to takes a, a spark going. to get a fire going. There yeah, you go. that's it. Yeah. And yeah. Anyway, so yeah, we were very enthusiastic, and we had a lot of fun with it. You know, and we were on fire for God, yeah. for the Lord. That's what was fun about it. You know, 
So that is fun. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, lots of. And guitars. And yeah, we had, um, like I said, I was, I was blessed to be in a great neighborhood because so many of the people that I was in the mm-hmm. neighborhood with, yeah. we all went to church together. We were all in new faith together. We were all in, we were kind of a support system for each other really all the way through until college. That's know, pretty so. awesome. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's a big blessing. Uh-huh. Lots of blessings. What kinds of, um, kind of where you grew up, what kind of stories do you have? that are fun stories either about your girlfriends or your brothers. Cause like, I mean, that, that could have gone, that could go either way, but like you got a fun story about the, the <laughs> girls that you grew up with or. <laughs> I told you I'm not good at stories. I need to talk to Gordon. <laughs> He's your story, man. Um, well, I mean, I, I still get together with those same girls, you know, uh, we started again at 50, yeah. and there's like 10 of us. And so um, we get together once a year, and then we always have reunions. And um, that's kind of the girls that I ran with pretty much all the way through. Well, you know, some would come in and out. Um, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I had a big station wagon, my parents' station wagon. So on Friday or Saturday night, I'd go around and pick everybody up. We'd get as many as we could in there. <laughs> Before seatbelts and all that. <laughs> no seatbelts needed, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, right. And we would cruise through. We had on our one of our main streets, we had a Steak and Shake and a Dairy Queen. So you went in Dairy Queen, out, uh-huh. up Steak and Shake, out, and you did that over and over uh-huh. and over again. <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to see who you could, kind of our hangout. Um, when you get together with those ladies now, older in life, mm-hmm. what do you talk about? How did that you know, if you if you went away to college, and I don't know if you had a gap at all in there, but what's what's the conversation turned into? You know, I think um, a lot of faith talks really? now, which is so uh-huh. interesting because even though we're all kind of in different places politically and and all that, but we um, we can talk about our faith, mm-hmm. you know, and we've gone through some illnesses with friends and stuff like that, um, and and we had one death, which was really hard. Um, and um, so, we, yeah, we talk about our faith and just, you know, a lot of memories. And we all know each other's families, you know, so mm-hmm. we know each other's parents. Although, like I said, I'm one of the last yeah, one yeah. that still has parents, or one parent now. Um, so we talk about families. And, and there's just some kind of a connection there with girls that you grew up with and even went to grade school with mm-hmm. that you just know everything really kind of about them, except maybe some of their more present things. Uh-huh. You're not going to know everything. Um, but we laugh a lot, you know, and um, play games together. And uh, it's just a big sleepover for a couple of days, you know. So it, it, I feel like that's really been a big thing and for all of us, you know, that we know we have that. Like even when Gordon was sick, I was able to pass that out. And they, you know, lots of prayers. Mm-hmm. That was one area of prayer. Um, so, yeah, so I think we're just kind of, we know that we can always be there for each other. There's a connection. That's a um, it's an interesting strength, you know, and that you have. Because one of the things that people are talking about a lot of the, just lots of different places today, is the epidemic of loneliness. Mm-hmm. And so here are these friends that are like lifelong friends that you're able to build and hang on to and connect with throughout life. And that's a that's a powerful strength that, mm-hmm. that you have. It is. I mean, I... Community is so important, and uh-huh. that's what that's why there's so much loneliness. You can't you've got to have community where you're actually touching each other, you're seeing each other. Right. It can't just be a community on your Facebook page, or you've actually got to physically be there to look at each other in the eyes. You mm-hmm. know, and um, that's what I've gotten here at Schweitzer. You know, I I think I'm blessed to have a lot of communities. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got a, a nice group of friends here too. So. And then women at church, and you just have a lot of different. I think it's good to have lots of different communities. You know, you build strengths from each other in different communities too. I think. Yeah. You said um, your brothers went to MU. Mm-hmm. Um, some of your girlfriends went to MU, but you chose SMS. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Why? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I do believe God goes before us in everything. Mm-hmm. I really do. I believe He's always preparing us for the next places, um, even though we don't realize it half the time. But when I was, my dad, like I said, was a dentist. I was a dental assistant with him for years. And his, one of his dental assistants uh, with me went to SMS. So she was always talking about it. She was a couple years older than me. So I think that was kind of why I went. And then also, like I said, half the girlfriends went and half the girlfriends Mm -hmm. didn't go. And probably the ones that I was the closest to ended up going 
to SNS. Hmm. And it was just far enough away. You know, back then you didn't have to be, you wanted to be a little far away, but not too far away that I could get home easily. And, um, but that, other than that, there really wasn't any connections there. Did so. you, did you imagine that Springfield would become like a, a place you'd call home? No, not at the time. I really didn't. Cause you never, you never think about where you're going to, cause I'd actually planned on, I graduated in 79 in the summer and I had this teaching degree uh-huh. and I'd actually thought I'll just go on back to St. Charles and do something else. And then I'll try to get a you know teaching yeah, yeah. job for the next year. Well, then I met Gordon. And so I decided to go ahead and stay in town. And that's why I had to find a teaching job in July, okay. which is very difficult <laughs> when school starts in August. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I taught at that small school. So no, I don't think I ever went into it knowing it would be my lifelong home. You know, we even got married here, which was kind of hard for mom being uh-huh. the only girl. Oh my goodness, you know, yeah. I didn't get married in our first Methodist church. You know. <laughs> so um, but we had made such a started making such a life here with friends and and Gordon and Gordon's older than me, so what was the uh, what was the spark between the two of you? What what was the thing that drew you and Gordon together? Well, I was probably a little infatuated with him. Like I said, he's older than I am, mm-hmm. and um, he seemed to have it all together. <laughs> <laughs> I was a senior, you know, and uh, he had a house, he had a car, he had a job. He had, uh, you know, a dog. He, <laughs> he, he just looked really settled in. Um, very, he's just got a lot of charisma. Uh-huh. You know, he's one of these people that kind of pulls you in. And uh, just real engaging and um, fun. We had a lot of fun together. But we always say in the, the place that we met, we met each other on these stairs, basically. Uh-huh. And both of us were like, oh, hi, you know. And we had never, I'd been a around him, probably seen him a million places, never had paid any attention to him till that one moment. And after that moment, so there's something to moments. Uh-huh. And I don't think it was really love at first sight, but interest at first sight. And after that, we just kept running into each other everywhere. And so um, we're like, we think that's a God thing. Because uh-huh. why, why then did we start running into each other everywhere we were going, you know, before we started dating? Huh. We didn't date right away. So, <laughs> but yeah, he still has that charisma. That spark. Yeah, and he is a storyteller. He is. I mean, I'm getting going. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless, he's got a great memory, though. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, he does everything. tell great story. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's yeah. it's a whole lot of fun. Um, we're probably opposites in a lot of ways, but that's what works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you you describe like the teaching job and then the travel agent job. Um, where were some of the fun places you went in that travel agent job that? Well, I never, I went to New York City. Um, most of the trips you went on then were to go check out an area okay. because you were, you were, you were yeah, yeah. you're basically selling mm-hmm. them. You're a salesman. Um, so New York, I went to Hawaii several times because that was a real big place back then. Um, where else did I go? Oh, Phoenix, the Arizona area. So just kind of pockets that were kind of popular areas uh-huh. at that time. Um, and you would actually kind of work while you were there. Um, and then we went, you got opportunities. Like we went on a cruise, just uh, the two of us, um, during hurricane season. <laughs> well, you got, it's the only time a travel agent could go. No. A cruise during <laughs> and, uh, hurricane season. <laughs> oh, but we didn't have a hurricane, but it was really rough while we were out there. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to think of some of that. Yeah, I didn't get to go to Europe, but we did go to Gordon and I've been to Europe several times just because of his mm-hmm. job. But um that was just a fun experience overall, just because you could like I said, it's kind of a salesman job, uh-huh. you know, and so you got to experience places through other people. <laughs> oh yeah. In a lot of ways. Yeah. And uh I met some really great people through all that. That's really awesome. Mm-hmm. So, so fun career. If you could I mean, think about either selling a trip to somebody now or maybe a place you've never been, what would that, do you have a place like that? Where would I want to go? Yeah. <laughs> I would like to travel more. Gordon's kind of in semi-retirement, but um, we would like to, um, he's probably more into the United States travel, which uh-huh. I'm good with too. There's lots of parks we'd like to see, some of the national parks. Um, but out of out of the, the country, I would love to go on a river cruise. That's one of my... Mm-hmm. Um, one of my bucket lists. Um, we did do quite a bit of Europe while 
when we were younger, but I'd like to kind of go back and do some of it again. I mm-hmm. uh, never have seen like Germany or uh, Switzerland. Um, wouldn't mind doing Italy again. Um, we did Africa, which was interesting, did a safari and all that. But yeah, just I want to see God's beauty. I feel like, you know, time is short, as we all know. Yeah. And I've been reminded of that a lot lately, yeah, just yeah. of people that have different ailments that we really need to um, go see the world while we can. So uh-huh. that's kind of one of our goals right now is to start doing some traveling every three or four months. That's a good goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was what was some of the fun times of being a mom to a couple of boys? <laughs> <laughs> well, I love being involved in all their sports. Yeah. You know, and um, watching them play sports and uh, being a part of, you know, any of the team stuff they were doing. And um, on Marshall's uh, senior year, I was the um, chair of their club, you know, their, I remember what you call it, the mom's club or something. But um yeah, just being a part of what they they did, I think, was probably the most joy I had. And um, just watching them become the men, I get so much joy now. And only one of the boys has children. But um, watching them become who God wants them to become, uh-huh. you know, watching them be fathers and, and uh, get involved in the community and, and be responsible and just, you know, good, good young men and, and made good choices in their wives. and and uh, But during those years, they were, I mean, we were, it was busy, you know, at home, um, trying to keep them busy because uh-huh. <laughs> they have a lot of energy uh-huh. and we live out on six acres. So it wasn't like I, had, I could just send them out in the neighborhood, yeah. you know? So we had a lot of friends come in, but we, we used our place. We have a tennis court and we set it up. We had a basketball goal. They played hockey down there. They played tennis, you know, yeah. one of them played on the, on the Glendale tennis team. And, and, uh, so just, you know, just. And I, you know, like I said, just being a part of everything they did was probably my biggest joy. Um, and yeah, they they were they were busy boys. Fought, they fought a lot <laughs> until I think it was about junior high was one of the last real knockdown, drag them out fights. I was like, we're not doing this anymore. You're too big for me to pull apart, <laughs> you know. So, but they, you know, they always say it's better to maybe do that than be like they were only two and a half years apart. Yeah, yeah. Than to be not ever interact with each other, uh-huh. you know. Even though sometimes it was negative, you know. Mm-hmm. I think in some ways they became closer from it <laughs> because at least they were paying attention to each other and had yeah. had to play together some. I'm sure. So, um, but now we have a lot of good memories of vacations. We, we there was a place we used to go to every year um, called Fripp Island up by in the Carolinas, South Carolina, and we did that every summer for several years, five or six years, and uh, drove it. So that we have a lot of memories of the going oh, and yeah, the coming, yeah. you know, and that was probably, oh, we did lots of Gordon loves Civil War and the boys coming. Uh-huh. Like, so I always had to stop at all the battlefields. And one time we came back when the Olympics were going on and actually stopped in the, at the Olympics and got to watch one of the basketball games when Michael Jordan was playing. Yeah, so. That would have been like the Atlanta Olympics, right? In yeah, it was Atlanta in Olympics. Yeah, yeah, I think that would have been it. Yeah. Wow. So we did that one, one of our trips. So that that was always kind of an adventure, family adventure, mm-hmm. was to travel and do that. So you mentioned somewhere in the midst of that time frame that you you felt like you had this craving for faith that kind of bubbled back up or was really significant. Mm-hmm. Um, did faith kind of go on a back burner for a while, or did it? Did it? I, take I a, feel like it did. You know, I'm always yeah. kind of in sharing a testimony that. Through college, you know, mm-hmm. I remember trying, you know, to get involved in one of their campus um, organizations, and it just didn't really kind of go anywhere. And for me, and um, so I would say during that time, it wasn't probably my focus. Mm-hmm. You know, I kind of got into the whole college life, you know. Um, and I'm, I remember still praying, but I don't remember really the relationship as much. Um, and then I think when I was really craving. I knew. I knew when, once I had my kids and everything. I knew I needed more. I wanted more, mm-hmm. and that was really when I got into BSF. Is when I really. I re. I remember getting on my knees and recommitting my life to Christ again, and realizing that I was still keeping things from Him. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's. I just remember that day saying, "Okay, I'm, I'm giving it all to you. I'm giving my temper. I'm giving everything I have." You know. Um, now we still keep pulling it back in. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're just kind of a constant work in progress on just letting go, letting go, letting go, and giving more and more. We still sometimes pull things in that 
even our social lives and stuff, those belong to God too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, everything kind of belongs to him, our finances, everything. So I remember that was a thing for me is when I really re- recommitted between me and God um, during that time. And then I think after that, I really started wanting to live more for the Lord, you mm-hmm. know, do more things uh, for him. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's such, it's a process. Our lives are such a journey, you know. They are. Even just reflecting as I've gone back and looked at stuff, you know, just how, just to see God and how he, his providence and how he's really, he is really leading us and guiding us, even though we're not asking to, you know, or not even aware of it at times. Uh But I think we all probably have lives like that, that we could see now, the way he prepared us to even get where we are today, you know, and went before us. Mm -hmm. So That's kind of the journey of, I mean... Abraham and Sarah, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, there, there's this call out of the wilderness to both of them. And they don't even see it. And sometimes, I mean, which is one of the reasons I think Sarah laughs when when the visitors show up and say, hey, your wife's going to be pregnant. She's like, are you kidding me? Like, there's so much, you don't have a clue as to who I am. And yet, I mean, the Lord does. Like, the Lord knows Sarah as much as mm-hmm. as, as he knows Abraham. And so there's this, this epiphany that comes to both of them that, He's been preparing him for a long time. Mm-hmm. And he really sees us. Mm-hmm. You know, we think sometimes, oh, we can hide from him. No, he sees us. He wants, he, he loves yeah. us. <clears throat> it, it's a love that, well, you know, it's still hard to grasp. I think that's one of my biggest prayers. Help me to grasp how wide, long, and deep, yeah. it's deep, is the love of Christ, you know. And um, I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that Genesis story, you know, about Abraham and Sarah, when she laughs, the Lord says, "Why does? Why did you laugh?" Like yeah. He heard that that very yeah, real. Yeah, He did hear it. Yeah. Um, expression of her heart, the deepest expression. Mm-hmm. He heard it, and it's yeah. profound that He hears ours too. I totally agree with that, and He does. You know, and it's it ta- it's life's journeys. I think that make uh-huh. us get to realize that you know yeah. that He really is there all the time. Even though we might not always realize he's there, I think you know all of our faith. You know, we go through. I know I have times when I don't know if I really could. I guess I want a feeling. If uh-huh. That's a woman thing. You want to feel. You know, mm-hmm. I want to know you're right here. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that sometimes we go through phases where we're like, "Where, where are you?" <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. But then we realize sometimes those places we're in, where we're like, "Where are you?" Are there for a reason? Mm-hmm. You know, that's where he's tempering us, or he's showing us something that we didn't know before, you know, and we just have to wait on him in those spaces and stay close to him in those spaces too. Yeah. I talked to a friend um, earlier today and he just said, I know for the place where I'm at right now that the Lord has drawn me here and this is where I'm, this is where he is and this is where I'm meant to be. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's an... Something to that assurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. of, Of knowing that. Yeah. Gives you a lot of peace. It does. Yeah, peace and, and, and hope. Focus. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned um, caring people, <clears throat> and that caring people is a single mom's ministry. So mm-hmm. what? What was the draw to that kind of ministry? I mean, because yeah, not being a single mom. You know? Yeah, you could have mm-hmm. done all kinds of things. You could mm-hmm. have been involved in all kinds of things. I mean, you you described this so much, like you said, you retired from that. So like you gave some good years to that. Mm-hmm. What was the draw to that ministry, and what did you like? What did you take away from it? Well, the draw. The woman that invited me to go to BSF that I played tennis with. Yeah, um, she'd probably be one I would say I, I admire, but she's also the one <laughs> that um, where I heard about caring people, and she's the one that asked me to get involved in it. Um, she had prayed over me, I guess, and felt like God was wanting me to get involved in the ministry. And um, it was also a little bit from a lot, lot, a lot of the women that were involved in that ministry were from um, Bible Study Fellowship okay. also. Yeah. And it was actually a ministry that was started by uh, Jody Hershend from Hershend Entertainment. Okay. Mm-hmm. It was really her vision. Mm-hmm. She actually had a dream. She had a vision to start this ministry. For She felt like single moms were outside the walls of the church. And so anyway, so really I, I'd say kind of my BSF people uh-huh. <laughs> are kind of how I got pulled into that through prayer. People had prayed. Yeah. 
um, that I would want to get involved in it. And so I just started out at the basic level, you know, just attending meetings and stuff like that. And then eventually I was asked to be the Springfield area chair. Um, and I, when I would tell my story about why I got involved, I really felt like I am married to a very busy man, and he would attest to that. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so even when I was raising the children, staying at home, there were times that I felt kind of single, you know, because he was starting his business. He was involved in a lot of things. Um, so I, I kind of can almost understand maybe what some of these women were going through of just how, even though sometimes even the men are present, uh-huh. they're, they're, they're just busy you know, at that time of their lives, very preoccupied. Uh, at times. And so I felt like sometimes I was kind of doing some things by myself, some some singly things. And plus, God really gave me a heart for him. You mm-hmm. know, even though I wasn't a single mom, he gave me a heart for them. And um, just really wanting to try to understand where they were, you know, and how they felt kind of ostracized. And so many of the circumstances of why they were single were just totally out of their control. Uh-huh. You know? And a lot of the ministry, we put them in small groups where they met on a, on a weekly basis with other single moms, and we yeah. had trained leaders. Yeah. Just and the whole idea was to show them Jesus, and um, then hopefully bring them into a church fold, you know, where they could uh-huh. have more, even more community, and also for the children. We always tried to plug the children into on the nights that we met. We also had play. Uh, some kind of a program for the mm-hmm. children. So they were also being fed Jesus too. And sometimes if they weren't churchgoers, that might be the only place they'd ever have mm-hmm. any kind of a really touch, you know. And um, and then we we had a, a, a ministry. Well, part, part of that is I was on a prayer team that met every week and we prayed over the ministry too. Mm-hmm. So we had a prayer mm-hmm. team that was another element. So we prayed over all the single mom's needs. All the leaders would turn in their needs, and then we would um, pray over the individual moms weekly. Hmm. So, um, and then, like I said, our goal was to just to set up care groups throughout the city. And we ended up meeting in churches, which is outside the walls of the church, which didn't seem to make any sense, but it 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 did because they met on a separate night. Mm-hmm. They had leaders, you know, that were um, just really speaking to them, you know, and then we had programs for the children. Yeah. We, we really wanted to have something for them. So, Were any of those stories that you encountered along the way, like did they just stick to you or like in some way where you, you, saw, um, res- you saw some, uh, thinking about a song that talked about, talks, the song speaks to the power of resurrection really where you saw resurrection take place in the lives of some of the people that you worked with? We saw, we saw many women being brought to Christ through, mm-hmm. through this program um, that never had really known Jesus at all. And like I said, had, had had so many bad experiences that they almost kind of rejected um, God. Mm-hmm. And um, Father, you know, we, we hear this a lot, you know, whatever you kind of think of your father yeah, yeah. is kind of how you see God sometimes. So um, we had that too, because a lot of them were from families that either the, either the fathers had left mm. or their, fa- their or husbands mm. had left. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why they were single. Um, yeah, I was amazed at some of the um, one one woman. I, I remember we had a group in Stratford for a while because I also we did yeah. have some outside the area. But when she first came into the group, she just on her own had heard about it. Would just sit in a corner totally by herself, wouldn't interact with anybody, and just had a lot of anger, a lot of just. Things that had occurred to her, and um, would just have really it was it was she was had nothing to do with anybody, and uh, eventually she came every week, and she then she kind of started getting her chair a little closer, you know, to mm-hmm. the group, and eventually got into the group, accepted the community, they accepted her. Now she never did go into some some of our single moms would actually go into leadership then, right? Yeah, I mean the groups that was kind of part of what we, we hoped would happen, yeah, yeah. and. Um, I just remember she just she really almost became a different person. She flourished uh-huh. once she accepted this community and accepted the Lord, you know, and saw uh-huh. that you know He was for her and not against her. Right. Um, she she really opened. She totally flourished. That's what I saw a lot of as women that went in with just so downtrodden, and they would flourish. You'd see them just open up. All of a sudden, they had these this group to talk to. They had a leader that was checking on them constantly, you know, and just. Really, the leaders would become part of their lives. You know, mm-hmm. whatever they needed help with, they needed. A, if they had a housing issue, they had somebody come alongside them and go with them. Um, 
as well as the moms they were meeting. So, yeah, I just saw a lot of women become who I think God wanted them to be, you know. It's um, amazing when you can have a Christian community who understands the basic thing that God is for, mm-hmm. for people, and then what kind of grace and power that, like, unleashes in a person's life. Because it just... It, it and I, I, I have a heart for that. I think that's... And maybe maybe that's where God, you know, we say, oh, he always goes before us, but a heart for the broken. I really, and I feel, because I feel like God and Jesus, they're really, they're there for the lowly and the marginalized. You know, we're all, I mean, mm-hmm. he's for all of us, mm-hmm. but I think he's seeking that. And I think through all these ministries now we're seeing, I know we have Embrace Grace here mm-hmm. now, and um, I think he's, he's seeking the lowly and the marginalized and wants to them to understand his love, how much he really, really loves them. And once we can... Grasp that. It's it's a grasp Jesus, yeah. Yeah. Life changing. It's incredible. Um just a, f- a few moments ago you were talking about what it was like to to see Gordon working so much in the business. And there were moments when you felt like you were a single mom yourself in that in that moment. I wonder if you got into the end. I mean, I know Gordon's not fully retired yet, but reflecting back upon what it's like to have a partner who's deeply invested in business and what kinds of things would you say to your 30 year old self self or your 40 year old self like what kinds of bits of wisdom would you say in that space i wish somebody would have said this to me it would have been really really helpful cuz it would have just made a lot of things more peaceful or or easier uh, would help me get through it. Have you thought about? I mean, I think you have to be true to yourself is one thing. And you have to allow your spouse to be really who God wants them to be. And they have to let you be who God wants you to be, mm-hmm. you know. And sometimes that is that can conflict a little bit. And, and Gordon and I had our difficulties, and he would be fine with me saying that. Um, we had our difficulties. And um, I think you have to never give up, you know, unless there's abuse or something like that. There's always, there's circumstances, but never give up and really just, you know, I love what Spencer says. You need to lower your expectations and just raise your commitment. I've I've used that line so many times Mm. um, in your marriage, you know, um, because I, I would probably expect too much, you know, at times instead of really trying to be compassionate to what he's actually going through, mm. you know, he's struggling to or whatever, expecting more out of them. I, I need help. I need this. I'm just trying to think. I, th- I think, like I said, you just you just have to be, you just have to continue to let God be who he's supposed to be with you. And as a couple, you know, we tried to, to do church and um, and keep God in the middle, keep Jesus in the middle of our relationships, keep that first. And that can be difficult, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I think it's important. And um, remember your vows. You know, that's you said that vow to God. <clears throat> and what else did you ask me? <laughs> well, that's 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 a good summary. I mean, some things that you would say to your your younger Yourself self at, at thirty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I think a lot of it is your lower your expectations and um, and just re- and really, you know, try like I said to, to have empathy for the other person. You know, mm-hmm. it's not just about me. Mm-hmm. It's it's something we're trying to build together as a family. And um, be 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 good. Just be you know, kind of stand in that place um, and claim it. You know? Yeah. Um, here's a question for the present moment. What's on your playlist? What do you listen to? A lot of Christian music. Mm-hmm. I listen to the, either The Message or um, 88.3, the, the Wind. Um, Gordon and I like rock and roll. <laughs> so we, <laughs> well, he's, he's, you know, he, he was in a band you uh-huh. know, all the way through college. Uh, well, actually in high school and college. And so he plays Beatles and, or did. He's not in a band now. Um, so we have a lot of, you know, if we're traveling, we'll put some rock and roll on or one of those 60s channels or one of the classic rocks or something like that. And we like going to concerts together. We've done that. Um, but now that I listen to a lot of Christian and um, any particular artists, oh, I, I like all of them, King, King and Country, and hmm. there's a new movie out about them. Um, and um, 
just a lot of the new stuff that's out. And then I, I and I'm a disco girl. I'd have to say, you know, really? I was, I, well, I was in the '70s, okay, you yeah, know. Yeah. So I mean, I don't sit and listen to disco now, but if I hear Bee Gees or something, brings back a lot of memories oh, of college. Yeah, yeah. like I love to dance. And I, I like music. You know, I play the piano. I was in choir all the way through um, high school in two or three different choirs. I was in musicals. Um, don't use it as much now as I should. I occasionally sit down and play the piano. But um, but I liked, you know, I, I liked all that. That was always a big part of my life growing up. What do you play when your grandkids are around? What kind of music? Yeah. We sing Bible songs, <laughs> <laughs> especially with my four-year-old Kate. Do we, I'm trying, we don't listen to music. If we do listen to music, it's probably more rock and roll because Gordon okay. will get his guitar out, yeah, yeah. you know, and sometimes we'll sing some of the old songs. And then they have some of their family songs that they listen to all the time, some Blake Shelton and some um, Proud to be an American. They kind of have some other little family songs that we'll start playing when they're with us too. Um, so, yeah, we, we've we've had some fun with Gordon playing the guitar with the kids. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, yeah, they like that. Yeah. Um. You you talked about Gordon's heart attack, and so that brings like a unique prism because you get to have all kinds of deep thoughts, and then you know you got to make a decision really quick, but about certain things. Um, but have you got a bucket list, or have you thought about like now that you've got this getting closer healthy, time, getting yeah. closer time? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, because it's been two years. Yeah, yeah, so he's like, yeah, he's doing like well. he's doing great. So, are there some things that you want to accomplish together? Well, that's interesting because I think we are really praying about that because we went to seed bed. We'd never had been to one of the new rooms before. Uh-huh. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to do yeah. that. And uh, J.D. Walt has kind of become a friend of ours. And um, he was a big prayer warrior for us also during Gordon's mm-hmm. heart attack. Um, he had a couple of devotions on Gordon, if you remember that. But anyway, we went to that. And one of the last things, you got to go up at kind of the altar and J.D. happened to be the one that anointed us and said that he really saw for our relationship that there was a lot, the best wine, how Jesus and the miracle oh, yeah. brought the, the best wine out last, yeah. <clears throat> that the best wine was coming out in our in our marriage. And in these last, we don't know how many years we have, right? And so we have kind of really held on to that, and we're praying about that, and we're like, well, what exactly does that mean? You know, so we're like, well, is there something we're supposed to be doing together, maybe for the Lord? Mm -hmm. And Gordon's been involved in some things that um, he's kind of starting to get out of now. So his time is being freed up because I probably have always had more time than he has. So we're praying about that. If there's something that God's wanting to move us to, if he's preparing us for something, as well as just wanting to do things that people do in retirement, you know, which is doing some some traveling, spending time with our kids. One mm-hmm. of our kids, like I said, is here, and then Mason, our other one, is other son and daughter-in-law are, are in Arizona. Uh, so we just got back from seeing them and grandkids. We're just really enjoying our two grandkids here and being involved in their sports and the activities that they do. So that'll – and then, you know, trying to get to still see my – I still have a mom, yeah, you yeah. know, and uh, trying to get up to St. Charles, and I've got – Two brothers up there and another brother in Chicago. So spending family time as long mm-hmm. as you know, as much as we can is real important to us. We're, I think we're very family oriented. Um, and then I know for me, I think I just kind of wake up every day and say, okay, Jesus, what are you doing and how can I be a part of it? And that's kind of my daily mantra. I think it is kind of what gets me up is I really want to be, that's my my prayer, I want to be his agent, I want to be doing what he wants me to be doing today. And the hardest part of that is we have to, in our own lives, we have to set some boundaries, you know, which mm-hmm. I'm seeing that. You know, yeah, you want to be with your grandkids all the time, but there's boundaries to everything. And um, so you can have that space. You've got, you've got to have the space to be obedient sometimes. And uh, I'm really trying, I think, more and more to spend time with him so I can hear his voice. And it's not like we physically always hear it, but he, yeah. we hear it. We hear it in our hearts. Mm-hmm. We hear it through the different ways he speaks to us. Um, that, you know, listen to me, you know. I think he, he really wants us to to be listening. Yeah. That's very important. And um, but as far as Gordon and I, yeah, I think we are looking. What We want to see, what, what do you, mm-hmm. God, what do you have? Let's, so we're very open. You gonna ask us to do something? No, <laughs> no. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna celebrate that you're open, and I love that that opening image where, where you talked about. JD said, 
Jesus brings out the best wine last, you know, and, and it's from John two. It's from the first miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee where, he, where they've run out of wine and Jesus turns water into wine and the, the master of ceremonies is shocked out of his, out of his mind. Like, why'd you wait to bring the best out now? And so mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. Story. It is. And it's, I and mean, it's his first miracle. It's his first miracle. Mm-hmm. But to have that as like an image, almost a, this, this word spoken in your life is like, that's a profound, that's a profound image mm-hmm. that is, that is dear. Um, may it be so for, for all of us who are married, like mm-hmm. may there be the best and, wine. Yeah. Last, and yeah. really actually for, for all of us and wh- whether we're married or not, that there would c- just continue to be good wine, the best wine that would be propelled in our lives. Uh-huh, that's uh, uh-huh. yeah, that's yeah. profound. Yeah. Cause I do, I do think in these seasons, like I said, you know, you could just spend a lot of time doing what you want to mm-hmm. do, but I do, I do feel like it's also the season retirement mm-hmm. season where the Lord really wants to flourish you sometimes mm-hmm. and just um, being open to, to his flourishing, you know, and just um, to be, just continue to be where he, what he yeah. wants you to be. Yeah. Where yeah. he wants you to be. Laura, there's a, a question I ask everybody who comes in here uh, at, at the end of, of our time together. And that is, what's a final word of advice that you'd love to share with us? I think the, one of the main things we have to remember is that God is in control, not us. You know, one of my things I always used to say was let go and let God, and um, that we really have to trust Him for mm-hmm. all the understanding and lean on Him um, and not our own understanding. Um, and I really believe we're, spo- we're supposed to take, take it to Him. And let it go, you know. And he will he he will work through things. Might not always be exactly what we expect. So I think that's been important in my life um, because we're all kind of wanting to pull, continue to pull things in. We've just got to to let let him do mm-hmm. it. And I think I think just really try to spend time with him. And that changes in our life depending on what our lives look like. You know, right now I can do I can do more contemplation and silence than I could when I was younger. Um, but to just really lean into those places that he's leading us to. Um, that's just another way he's going to continue to speak to us and grow grow him in us. Another thing I think is important is trying to stay humble, just humility. I mean, he's really been speaking to me about that a lot, that um, just be true to who we are and who he made us to be and live into that, lean into that. Um, and just that that's where a lot of our freedom comes from if we're mm-hmm. really – Lean into who he made us to be, you know, and be humble in that and be okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thankful in all circumstances. Okay. Because I'm realizing lately, you know, that um, we, life is just going to be a constant up, down, mm-hmm. all that. And really to try to be thankful wherever we are, try to concentrate on that. And I actually had written down this scripture, uh, Philippians 4, 8, that we all hear, but I, I, I do think this is so true. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And because everywhere I go now, somebody's sick or something's going on, and just to concentrate, though, on the good. Yeah, yeah. You know, what is good, what is trustworthy, what is excellent what is praiseworthy and to kind of let that be how you live. Yeah. So it's a great, great word. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming in, for sharing your story, for fun. describing, you know, your life and, and the lessons you've learned along the way. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, it was enjoyable. Well, a big thank you to Laura for sharing her story. In listening today, I hope that you were inspired, encouraged, and challenged, and that you begin to behold the really cool people that are around you each and every day. The Really Cool People podcast is produced by Schweitzer Church, Springfield, Missouri. Taylor Likes is our executive producer and editor, and I'm your host, Jason Leidinger. You can help us by liking, reviewing, and sharing this podcast. And until next time, stay cool. Stay cool.